In this segment, we're going to talk about managing code and the use of revision control systems for this process. And we're interested here in projects that involve multiple people and where the complexity is of a certain level. And revision control systems are the primary tool to handle large amounts of code and keep them in sync. So let's give you a brief history of revision control systems. Revision control systems involve a system that stores previous version of the code and allows comparisons with newer versions. And this involves undo, seeing what's changed, and all those good things. They can be the local, that lives on your local file system, or they can be server-based. The original revision control system is coming called SCCS, Source Code Control System. And this goes all the way back to 1972. So if you remember that computer science as a field probably started in 1970 or software engineering, this is from the beginning, effectively, of the process. The first commonly used one, or at least the first one I encounter, is RCS, Revision Control System. This started in 1982. This operates on one file at a time, and it was still in use in the 90s. So you would have a file main.c, that's the file you're working on, and in the same directory you'd find a file main.c, v, which would store all the previous versions of the file to allow you to go back and forth. So it was a different control system for each file. This was a file-based system. CVS, Concurrent Version System, this came out in the late 80s, and this was the first whole project system, and it was server-based, and this is where large multi-programmer software systems based in different locations started using this and that was the beginning of that process. And then Subversion, this started around 2000 and this was the most common system until about 2015. This fixed many of the problems with CVS and this was the first really user-friendly revision control system that non-expert programmers could actually use. But the reality is that the winner now, the most common one, is Git. Git is a distributed repository. It was developed originally for the needs of the Linux kernel, which is probably the largest open source project out there. It was developed for speed. It has a simple design. It's fully distributed, meaning that the local computer and the server all have equal copies of the entire system. And it can handle large projects efficiently. And one of the big things about Git is that it has strong support for nonlinear development. This is thousands of parallel branches. And this is where Git really shines. And we'll talk about branching in the next slide. For those of you who are not familiar with Git, there are many books on Git. One of them is this book by Chuck and Straub called Pro-Git that you can find online and is well recommended. So what do we mean by branches? This is one of the most important parts of Git. Let's say you have the main branch. This is where the code is, and we're working along each box represents another version of the software a day later, a week later, a month later, depending on your timeline. And now you need to make some dramatic change, some major feature revision, and you create a branch. A branch is a copy of the code, so the purple thing is now a copy of the code. You work on that branch and you implement the new feature that you want to implement. In the meantime, your colleagues are working on the main branch and they add new features as well. And at some point, we merge back. We take our changes and we merge them back into the main branch. And this sort of reincorporates the work we did on the side branch into the main flow of the program, at which point the branch gets deleted. Now, somebody else at the same time may have created another branch. They wanted to work on a different aspect of the code. They kept working on it. And sometime later, that second branch, let's say the bluish branch, also gets merged into the main. And this is how Git works. We create branches. We work on a different feature, we merge them into the main, and then we delete the branches and we keep going on. And the important lesson here is that anytime we have a tool like this, which is central to what you need, like Git, you want to master your tools. You want to get familiar with Git and learn how all these branching structures work and how you check for differences across branches and how you do merges. Those are all important things that one must know. Git and GitHub are a pair. Git is the software for managing the repositories, and GitHub, github.com, is a service that provides repositories. And this is now owned by Microsoft over the last few years. There are other services, GitLab, for example, that use the same principles, but we'll stick to GitHub for our description because it's by far the most popular and the most commonly used. So let me give you a short primer on Git for those of you not familiar with it. Git, you can think of it as Something like Dropbox on steroids, it allows you to share files and their revisions and to go back and have different versions and to merge versions and do all those good things. The server has the official repository, at least that's the nominal, it's a policy. There's nothing in the software that mandates that, but the official copy is usually the one that's on the server. You create a copy or a clone of that repository, you work on your machine and make changes and commit them to your clone, and then you synchronize your clone 
with the server. That is the basic process. So let's look at the same thing in flowchart format. This is your workflow. On the left, we have the cloud, this lighter color background. And on the right, we have your computer. And that's a slightly darker background. We have a repository on a server, perhaps github.com. We have a local repository on your computer. This is the copy of the repository that lives on your computer. And we have your local files that those are the ones you're editing, changing, working on. So the process goes as follows. First, we clone. We take the repository, make complete copy on the local repository. And you do this once when you start working on a project. And then we do a git pull, and this happens regularly, which is we synchronize the copy of the repository on the local repository. So we synchronize the server to a local repository and to the local file system. So we have files that we can now work with, edit. When we make changes and we are ready to send our changes upstream, we first add them, and this puts them in a temporary local staging area on our computer. You add all the files, this happen one at a time, two at a time. And when you are ready, we have something that sort of works, we commit it to the local repository. And this creates a new version of the software in the local repository. This is still local. You do multiple commits, perhaps. And then eventually, you can push your code changes from your local repository back out to the server. Now, all those words, add, commit, pull, push, those are all Git commands. And this is effectively what you would type in the system. And there are many tutorials and guidance documents to Git. One that I like and one of my students found is this Git cheat sheet that comes from a web page called JRebel and shows you all the Git commands. For example, there's a Git diff that shows you the difference between your current version of the code and what's in the repository. There is Git log, it shows you the list of changes. There's a Git branch command that helps you work with branches. And there are other functionalities. There's a lot of functionality in Git, and I encourage you to become familiar with this if that's what your environment uses. The final thing we're going to talk about in this segment is use the use of GitHub as a collaboration environment. So it's more than a place to store code. It's a place where we can collaborate. So one should probably never commit, this is a good rule of thumb, to the main or the master branch directly. You ensure that the main always had a working version. And so when we want to make changes, we create a branch, work for a while, we commit regularly. And when this is ready, we create what's called a pull request. We say, OK, this branch is ready to be merged into the main. Then we ask a colleague or a supervisor that may be policy in your company as who do that as, as the reviews. We make changes as needed, and we re-review. We respond to comments. There's a whole lot of commenting going back and forth. When this is ready, we merge the branch into the main branch, and then we delete the branch, because this was a temporary structure that we're now able to delete. And you should really make an effort to keep branches short-lived. One of the things, if you look at this process, and you think a little bit, this is very compatible with a quality management system. We have reviews, we have documentation, we ask people to read, we know who did what, and there's a whole history of this process that's stored. And that's very compatible with operating under design controls and the creation automatically, if you wish, of a design history file type situation for the code. Let's just look at a worked example of how this would work in practice. Let's say we have now issued a pull request. This is a request for changes, for review. We can see, and you can, in a small font here, the red and the green are what change in the code. Let's zoom in here. Perhaps the original had the word setup 10. I'm going to circle it here. And then the change became setup 12. So now you can see what change in your code. You can put them side by side. And now you can actually review that and submit either a comment or an approval, depending. So here I said, this looks good because I have reviewed the code and it looks fine. So this is a good first step. Here's another example here where if we zoom in a little bit, again, this is what the Zoom looks good business, but we could have added a comment here, or we can request changes depending on what needs to happen. And then when you're all done, and you can't read this phone, but what I want you to see is just the list of all the things. These are all the comments that detail. You know, somebody requests submit the code, somebody requests the changes, somebody reviewed it, somebody approved. And this is essentially the point of a QMS as well. We have now this complete revision and approval system with dates and times as to who coded it, who reviewed it, who made changes, who did the final approval. And this is a good way to do this. And we have a record now for later auditing as needed. It's not necessarily foolproof. I think there are ways to change these records. It's not permanent. But that's true of all kinds of records. But it's a very useful way to go back and review the history of the code. So this concludes our discussion of programming as such. In the next few segments, we'll switch from programming to testing to actually running the code in testing mode to make sure that it works. Thank you.